Okay, let's get underway. Thanks everyone. Good afternoon and thank you for your attendance to the first of our Wimmera Development Association and Leadership Wimmera Community Leaders series of forums with our special guest, Christine Cota. My name is Jessica Grimble and as the Project Manager um, for Leadership at Wimmera Development Association, I'll be your facilitator today. Before we begin, uh, Wimmera Development Association and Leadership Wimmera wish to acknowledge the traditional owner groups of the land on which we meet. Here in the Wimmera being the Wachabolic, Wagaya, Jabagok, Jadwa and Jadwajali people. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Today's forum encourages participation, but I do ask that you mute your microphone during the presentation and there'll be a chance for questions towards the end. Please note this forum is being recorded as well. As I mentioned, today we welcome Christine Cota to share her knowledge and tips for success when it comes to community leadership. Chris provides expert professional services in the fields of strategy, governance, leadership development, complex inquiries, reviews and facilitation. She is highly regarded independent chair, company director and strategic advisors to CEOs, senior executives, board chairs, directors, councillors and committees. Chris has unique insights and understanding of what leaders need to know and be able to do in order to deal successfully with adaptive challenges. Excuse me. Chris has facilitated consultations around Victoria for two Royal Commissions, including the 2009 Bushfires Royal Commission and the 2015 Royal Commission into Family Violence. She was appointed to similar roles for the 2011 Flood Review, the Government Review of the 2013 Harriet Bill Fires, the 2014-15 Hazelwood Mine Fire Inquiry and the Inquiry into the EPA. Chris will unpack community leadership with our guest panellists. Liana Thompson is a self-described local government uh, tragic she has held many roles, the last Mayor of the City of Port Melbourne and the first for the City of Port Phillip. She was founding President of the Victorian Local Government Association prior to moving to the administration side of local government. She has worked with many local governments and has held three direct roles and has been at the Northern Grampian Shire as the CEO since November. Josh Koenig is the Executive Officer of Uniting Wimmera and has worked in community welfare for about 12 years. He became involved in boards and committees throughout this time, and he's also a councillor for the Horsham Rural City Council, where he was elected four years ago. Josh is a Leadership Wimmera graduate and sits on the advisory committee, as well as the Wimmera Development Association board. We thank you all for your time today. Um, before we do hear from Liana and Josh, we'll hear from Chris. I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you for the, for the invitation. Um, uh, that long and boring uh, CV uh, is, is partly due to the experience I've had in, in your area. You don't realise this, but let me, let me explain. Um, so I finished work with the, uh, the Black Saturday Royal Commission in 2009, and I thought that that would be the biggest uh, crisis or disaster event that I would have anything to do with. Um, However, in 2011, I got a call to do similar work uh, in your region uh, because the, uh, the state government had called a review into the floods that many of you will remember or will have had a part in or will have had your lives affected in some way, some way because of that. Uh, Neil Comrie did that review as a former police commissioner and I assisted him by designing and, and running those consultations. And I think we had about 550 people from your area in about 17 locations and what it taught me when I put together the Bushfires Royal Commission and the Flood Review is that um, crises come in waves and they're not a single isolated event that have a beginning and a middle and an end. In fact, they affect people's lives for a very long time afterwards. And the second Thing that it taught me was that no matter how well prepared we are for the next crisis or bad surprise, we're never well enough prepared. But the last thing that your region taught me was something about um, uh, people being able to adapt, to change, to become more resilient and to work alongside uh, all of the agencies and the volunteers and the government departments uh, the media, all of those groups who fetch up during a, an emergency or a disaster. But what I learned most was something about uh, community leadership of the most extraordinary kind that has a much longer and more lasting effect on the health of a community the other side of a difficult traumatic crisis 
or event. I'm now working with the third Royal Commission, the Mental Health Royal Commission, uh, and I'd have to say that um, uh, a lot of what I learned in your region, and I have been back many times, I have to say, not because things have been difficult there, but because I actually love that part, <laughs> your part of Victoria. Um, so I, th those lessons have come with me for a good number of years, and I'm very grateful that I'm going to have uh, some time with you all over the next three weeks as these sessions unfold to explore some of that. So in some ways, I'm sort of giving back some of the lessons that you might already know really well, in which case I hope that these are reminders. Uh, if these are new to you, then um, let me say that I'm proud of my association with your region and I'm humbled by the lessons that people in your community have been able to pass on and, and let me know about. Um, I'm really pleased to have Liana and Josh uh, with us today. Um, I'm, I'm out of Melbourne. I'm, I'm in Hawthorne at the moment. Um, I, so I know something of your area, but the deep expertise that Liana and Josh and, and, and all of you will have will be really valuable as we go through some of the points that I want to make. Um, so the first thing that I'd say is, uh, I guess I'm working around Victoria a lot at the moment in communities and starting to have face-to-face -face meetings and get out and about a lot more. Um, uh, Zoom is fabulous but I never want to continue all of my relationships with people through Zoom. So, so I, I should, say that, should say that to begin with. But um, let, me, let me just summarise by saying that I can see communities making a choice between two futures. And I'm just going to summarise this. One, one is that they, they believe that they will be weaker, poorer, uh, more dependent, on support from outside of the region. Uh, when I'm talking to people, they are less hopeful and they're more accepting, or they believe, no, maybe they believe that uh, the changes that have occurred over the last uh, n number of months, and if I go right back to the summer of fires in some parts of Victoria, that these are changes that come about without any control, that they just happen to us and we are enfeebled by them. Uh, there's another future that I think some communities are displaying, green shoots, that are much more resilient. Uh, they talk as if, and I'm just generalising wildly, but they talk as if people believe that they can be economically secure and sustainable. And they're certainly talking about being more adaptable. So it's, it's a place, it's an area, it's a region where people want to live, they want to work there, they want their kids to grow up there and they want to stay. So uh, it'll be no surprise to you about which of those two futures I'm going to choose to make a couple of comments about community leadership. Uh, so right now across the state, I think we're feeling the effects of a health and economic crisis that we didn't ask for, we didn't invite. Uh, we were probably not particularly well prepared for, and we don't know how long it's going to last. Uh, what we do know is that, uh, and even the last 24 hours or so in politics, or maybe the last couple of months in politics are telling us that um, it's very hard to sustain trust in leadership. So I put trust on my list of, of requirements for leadership at the moment, and it is a very fragile and perishable thing. I'm just very conscious of that being sort of in the back of my mind. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about community leadership because um, I want you to think about people who you think of when I use the words community leadership. And before you actually answer that question, I'm, I'm going to suggest a couple of things while you're thinking about this, because I think that in some communities, community leaders are actually quite hard to spot. Uh, the community leaders that I'm talking about are not inside organisations necessarily. They, they might be, but that's not necessarily where they run their sense of community leadership. From. Uh, they don't necessarily have a title, they don't necessarily live inside an organisation, they don't necessarily have a big office, uh, they don't necessarily even find themselves employed. And they are people of any age, any circumstances, uh, either gender, um, doesn't matter so much where or how they live, they are people who will often have a series of roles and interests and experiences. They might already be on uh, a committee or a board, uh, they might be public servant, they might have put themselves up for public office, 
could be in emergency services, et cetera, et cetera. So they're not, they're not tied to a particular profession or role that even has the word leader or manager in it. So my sense of community leadership is much broader. These are people who can come from anywhere at any time and make a contribution. And without trying to invent a term, um, I do see pop-up leadership. In other words, people who are with us for a particular period of time, they make an extraordinary effort and then they disappear. They don't, they don't fetch up again. We don't, we don't know them. We don't necessarily recognise them. They remain anonymous because they're not about self-promotion or ego and they don't do this kind of work for the money. So I'm, I'm curious if I ask you about who comes to mind. You don't need to give me names, but who, who comes to mind when you think about leaders in your community? And I'm, I'm just going to pause there and see if uh, there might be a couple of suggestions coming from you. Who are the community leaders that come to mind when I use that term? Anybody. Might be you, so don't, don't be shy. Anybody got to make a suggestion? We've got club presidents in our chat box here. Okay. Christine, I think uh, what you said about the pop-up thing was interesting. I think that uh, reflecting even the time span you've talked about since Black Saturday, so the last 10 years, there have been different times when maybe certain people have stood up and, uh, and um, I think in particular along the emergency services line, uh, flood versus fire, yep. um, you know, even at the moment, COVID-19, thinking that people um, in, the, in our hospital sector names we perhaps never would have really heard of before um, have come to the fore and, 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 and God willing in a few months time that'll, that'll sort of they'll move on and it'll, you know understand what you're saying about that pop-up thing um, mm -hmm. and also I think there's I can think of other people in our community who've just simply been here for a long time and have earned, have earned the respect of the community yeah yeah so I think Mark you've touched on um, a, a couple of attributes that I think the community leaders that I think make a contribution um, carry along with them. Uh, one is that um, they're usually known by the local community and carry respect. Now, whether that's because they've been there for a long time or because they know stuff, uh, that's a really important element. I guess what I'm seeing more and more of is that um, this, this view that during an emergency, there's lots and lots of resources that arrive in a local community and they come from elsewhere. And look, over the last couple of months, uh, the largest employer in the country has been the Commonwealth government. So there's, there's that happening at one level, but it's at that local level, it's in the neighborhood level, it's in your area and your region, that the chances are that when some of those, some of those supports are no longer in place, it'll be those people who are still with you and who will stick through the changes and keep refreshing people's enthusiasm for leadership. They're, they're sitting there in the heart of resilience. So let me just run through what I think are a couple of, and I hope that you've, you've, I hope that lots of people have sprung to mind as we've been talking about community leadership. But let me just say a couple of things about how you know that they're actually, that they've been there because they don't necessarily, uh, have the symbols of leadership and they don't have the title or the, or the role. So I think what I've, what I've been seeing over the last couple of months is um, the accumulation of small kindnesses, if I can put it that way. And for me, community leadership comes out of an accumulation of small acts of service. Not necessarily because people put their hand up and say, I'm gonna be community leadership, but uh, they are often small, singular acts or events or activities. And it's really only when you roll them up that you understand something about the worth and the amount of difference that it's made. So uh, in, in lots of communities, these are individuals who have, um, for example, helped others get online when they didn't know how to or didn't have the confidence. They were patient with talking to people about how to access information and, and access other people for the first time. There'll be people who'll support a local, a local business that's on its knees. 
in in my neighbourhood here, in a couple of streets away, um, it was putting teddy bears in the windows because they knew that during lockdown, as kids were walking around, they could count them. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but it really, if you looked at the smiles on the faces of those kids, you realise that it was a gift to an anonymous person. And that was incredibly important. Uh, there were people in my street who set up a WhatsApp site, who delivered food, who collected, uh, collected prescriptions for people. Um, there were people who also thought that, and I live in a small street, there were people who also thought that there were a lot of women who were experiencing, um, I, I guess, a, a much greater burden because they were homeschooling, they had kids to mind, they, you could see them on Zoom, they had pets crawling all over them, they had kids, they were always hungry. I mean, I'm, what is it about kids? They're always, I don't have any, but they, they seem always to be hungry. Um, anyway, they, 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 were, they were people who just went about um, offering some kindness to people they didn't know and who they didn't owe anything to. Uh, it was interesting to listen also to their language because there are lots of people who are saying, oh, well, when we get back to normal. There's a whole other session possibly around this because I don't think normal is just sitting around out there waiting for us to pop back again. I think some things have fundamentally changed. And I guess, um, so let me say, we would have a number of really painful conversations during the Bushfires Royal Commission where after Black Saturday, people wanted the previous Friday back and it's not available. There's something, uh, I'm just conscious that there's something deeply important about um, the conceit of romanticism, can I put it that way? The kind of longing, longing for things to kind of go back to the way they were, as if they were not disturbed and never will be again. But I suspect, and your regents taught me this in part, that um, there'll be successive waves of bad surprises and some communities will deal with this in a much more resilient way or stronger way. Uh, the sort of values of people that I'm thinking about, um, they if, I, if I tried to summarise what their question to other people would be, their question is, how can I be useful to you? And they just go about doing it. Uh, they understand that uh, change takes a really big emotional toll and I'm working with lots of people who are frightened and anxious and uncertain, uh, working with lots of other people who are frightened, anxious and uncertain and they don't fully understand what's going on but these are people who make connections and that's the next point that I would make. They are, uh, they wouldn't necessarily describe themselves as networkers but they gather other people around them, around an idea or an effort or an event and they're the, they're the volunteers who are really easy if I can put it that way, to get hold of around an emergency, they, they fetch up. Uh, they realise that uh, it's about refreshing and replenishing energy, that that's part of what it takes to keep people going. And they also realise that recovery is one single story, as if there's a simple narrative that goes, that in any community goes from a beginning to a middle and an end, that there are lots and lots of different ways in which people cope and adapt. And I guess, um, I guess what I'm going to say finally is that, um, at least in the time that I've got now, uh, this session is one example of community leadership. In other words, uh, a group of people, a small number of people, get together and say, this matters, it would make a difference, let's do it. So if anything, leadership is about gathering other people around a good idea and making it happen without insisting without uh, punishing them if they don't comply, without mandating it, but they make it happen. So we get nearly 30 people together on a Tuesday morning to talk about community leadership. And if that effort isn't an example of community leadership, then I don't know what is. So, uh, so just, just very quickly, when I'm, when I'm running community consultations or I'm talking to others about how to have this, con this conversation about community leadership and how to keep it most effective, um, I'm not going to say that I've run consultations around three Royal Commissions using these questions, but they are heart of the matter. So let me say that I've lent on these questions a bit or their variations. So the, first, the first question has been, uh, what as a community do we want to preserve because it's worked for us really, really well? What are the things that we really value that we want to hang on to 
and that we can actually improve. Uh, the second question, and you can sort of see where this is going, is what hasn't worked quite so well, that we can actually, um, and I'm not going to say uh, don't waste a crisis, but there you are, I've just said it. Uh, what, what are some of the things that haven't worked so well in this community? And what have we learned about in terms of what, what can we actually, perhaps we've been too lazy or we've been stuck in the past or too conservative or not cared enough, but now it might be possible to change. And, and what, would that, what would that actually look like? What would that be? And the third question is, um, what would it take to make that happen? You see, in this conversation, um, I guess I always have the view that better is always possible, that better tomorrows are always out there. And that when you're working with a group of people, they will know what some of that will look like. So very simply, um, what's worked really well in this community that we want to hang on to? What hasn't worked? quite so well and we've now got a real opportunity to stare quite hard at that and see what we can actually shed or change or improve and what would better look like. So you see in all of that is a sense of uh, optimism and confidence and hope but without the romanticism that says uh, don't worry because any day now somebody in a lab somewhere will develop a vaccine and we'll all be okay. Uh, we might not be, or that vaccine might take a long time, or it might never occur. And by then, you see, I'm really over COVID, but it might not be over me. So the chances are that I could be living under these circumstances that I didn't ask for, that I'm not welcoming, that I wasn't particularly prepared for, for a very long time. But I think part of the work of leadership is to offer people confidence and hope. And whilst I really want to do that with people who have got official leadership positions, in the meantime, I'm going to stay up close to the people in my neighbourhood and my area who I think have got that worked out, and I'll keep leaning on them to grow some resilience. So, Jessica, I'm going to hand that back to you because I know that you're going to take us into the next part of the time that we've got. That's wonderful. Thank you, Chris. And certainly welcome people asking some questions of Chris um, towards the end of the session. But I'd now like to bring in Liana and Josh um, to answer a couple of questions um, with regards to community leadership. So let's start with Liana Thompson. Could you introduce yourself to people on the call and just share with us why it is that you do what you do? What motivates you? Hi, everyone. Um, so why do I do what I do? Uh, I love working in local government, like I call myself a local government tragic, because the things that we can do in local government has an effect on people's lives. We can, when we're good, we're so good. And when we're not so good, we've got the opportunity to improve. Um, what I love is creating spaces for people to come together and work together for a common theme. And in my world, it's local government, so I, it's usually within municipal boundaries or a bit further. But I really believe that um, that's what my calling is, to be working with communities, whether they happen to be uh, in the country or in the city. But it is all about how is it that we can provide the best life that we possibly can for participants. And that's each and every one of us. Thank you. And Josh, how about yourself? What motivates you in your work? Thanks, Jess, and um, thanks uh, for having me along today. Um, the invitation. I look at the names on the on the board here, and I feel um, quite humbled to be talking to everybody who's um, tuned in today. So, I guess why I do what I do, I've, um, as you indicated at the start, I've worked at uh, Women Uniting Care, and now uniting for the last twelve years, and. Um, long time in one job, but I've actually um, had about eight jobs in that time and been able to reinvent myself throughout the journey, which has been really important to stay with the one organisation, I feel. Um, but why uniting? Why community welfare? Um, again, because of the different jobs I've had. I started in disability support and um, that's when I really, um, I guess, figured out that I wanted to help people in the, in the sense that um, help people that you wouldn't be able to... Um, to help, in my opinion, in any other role um, other than what the work Uniting does. So um, to be able to influence um, consumers' outcomes, to be able to keep families together, to be able to change people's lives, that's why um, I do what I do. And I'm really proud to work for Uniting, whose values and um, 
and and purpose really aligns really well with me. Um, so community welfare has kind of sucked me in 12 years ago and, and I'm still here because it's the kick I get. I see people that I've supported over the journey and my team supported over the journey in the supermarket and, and places like that. And they give you a nod, they give you a little hello and keep on working, but you know they're doing okay. So that's why I do what I do. It's because of uh, the kick I get from seeing people better themselves within our community. That's great, thank you. And Josh, we'll stick with you. When we say the term community leadership, what does that mean to you? Um, I guess if I look at, I'm in a really fortunate position to be on council as well for the last four years. So I've, I've had a really uh, a great privilege in seeing a number of people um, contact council, come through council in different forums. Um, so community leadership for me is the glue. It's the glue that holds everything, everything together. I think everything that's great about our community together, I think it's, uh, the service clubs, volunteer organisations, sporting clubs, advisory committees, um, people that give up hours upon hours of time um, with often quite um, quite often no um, financial reward, no, no reward apart from getting their club, getting their um, their service, um, you know, running like a well-oiled machine it is. And, and community leadership for me is, it's more about those people that, uh, in the background, Chris alluded to it at the start um, in her in her opening. It's the people that um, are in the background doing all of this work and not necessarily getting the accolades, but doing it for the love of the community and the clubs and the organisations that they support. Great, thank you. And um, your wife was a fantastic community leader for us only very recently with her campaign, um, H for Horsham, so that was great too. Um, Liana, yourself, what does community leadership mean to you? Um, I think Chris really encapsulated it so well, and so has Josh. And uh, so for me, it is those people uh, throughout our community that are passionate and want to make a difference, want to improve something. And the something might be uh, more recycling. The something might be ensuring that the football netball club is sustainable into the future. Um, I, I think it is all about uh, the giving of usually your passion, because that's what drives us, and then how that affects uh, local community and then really increasing uh, opportunities for people and making it better. I also use this same principle uh, at, a, at an organisation level. I believe organisations are our own communities as well. So I've got leaders right through my organisation at Northern Grampian Shire. Now, they may not have a title, but the work that they do in cr connecting, creating, serving uh, the people of the Shire is magnificent. And um, so I think we've got different community leaders in different settings, but the passion's a, a really important part of it. Liana, you may have answered my next question, and that's a really nice segue. We often do, some, title, some people recognise leadership with a title, but we know that people can have influence regardless. So can you provide examples or an example of people or traits um, that you feel are good, strong community leaders in your, in your networks? Thanks, Jessica. Um, I love anyone who gives something a go, who's really passionate and, uh, you know, acknowledges or, or sees that there's a, an issue, a problem, something that can be solved, and then marshals the resources and the thinking around how we might fix it or how we might improve it. Um, I adore that. And at Northern Grampian Shire, so I've only, I'm a blow-in. Uh, I've been here for six months and three of those I've been stuck at home. Um, so I haven't gotten to have the real opportunity of having a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, meeting with people. Uh, but what I know about my own organisation is that people are really innovative and can make things work in a really smart way. So what's important, I think, is innovation, ability to think outside the box, have a go, really have a go, not be scared about failing because we all fail at something. And 
along the way, we actually have a bit of fun, a bit of sense, sense of humour, and we connect as human beings. So I've got leaders right through my organisation and uh, the Shire's in a great uh, state that it is because of many, many people's work, not just people with um, a councillor title or a manager title or a CEO title. That's wonderful, thank you. And Josh, would you like to address that question as well? Um, yeah, so for me, Jess, it's around um, community leadership a title or a role and I think people that know me um, throughout this councillor journey and even the, uh, my role in the EO is you can pretty well leave the title at the door when you come in and have a conversation with me because um, at the end of the day um, leadership for me isn't about it doesn't start with that leadership for me starts with um, Leanna's hit it on the head with people willing to have a go and make mistakes so I think that's a really big um, a big part of being a really good leader is showing your vulnerabilities and being able to put your hand up and say, listen, I've, I've buggered that one up, um, but this is how we can work together and move forward. So for me, that's a really important um, piece of being a leader. When I think about um, uh, influence throughout the Horsham community, so um, where I've lived and um, grown up and, and never left, um, I think of people like um, Simon Risen, Jeff Pekin, uh, Bev Mayaki, um, you know, people like Wendy Mitchell, Di Bell, all of these people that have um, have got, without trying too hard, a following. People have gravitated towards them to really um, follow in their journey, whether it's um, whether it's trying to better a certain element of the community or whether it's trying to get more recently food out to the vulnerable or communication out to the vulnerable. It's these people that have really um, stepped up, and I think they continue to step up over the over um, the period that I've been well, you know, more aware of community issues so into adulthood. And I think um, they're the leaders that I, I choose to follow. I think um, titles, whilst I respect titles um, a great deal, um, it's not what gets me over the line when I'm setting up a meeting with someone. It's more about influence and it's more about um, if they're genuine and willing to help uh, the community and our people. So, in kind of nutshell. Thanks, Josh. That's great. We'll stick with you again. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about decision making. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you go about reaching a conclusion or a decision, um, a motion perhaps, uh, with your councillor hat on, um, that is representative of your, of your community or your organisation and its needs and providing some advice to those on the call around um, how to go about making a decision that is reflective? Yeah, I think... Um if I, if I reflect on um, my work at Uniting and it's and um, it's a bit more, I think I've got a little bit more rope as far as if you're, um, you're kind of strapped into the monthly meetings and things that, um, at, at local government. So, but because of the role I'm in here at Uniting and the nature of the work and the decisions that I've got to make, they'll always be scrutinised because um, it's, it's the nature of the work we do, but that's okay. Because um, at the end of the day, the programs and services are for the community. So I'd expect scrutiny on decisions. Um, so what's worked for me, I, I made a really big decision last year and I think um, that was around closing a program that had been long, long established within the community and it wasn't, it wasn't an easy decision at all. I think um, what people don't see is the months of preparation and research to go into it behind the scenes. So um, throughout that process, I um, trusted a group of people that really understood our programs, really understood it from the ground up, um, impact on... Uh, if we're looking at all factors, so the impact on budgets, outcomes, community reputation, consumer um, consumer outcomes, we had to get a really good feel about all of that. And very early on in the piece, we asked ourselves, you know, small group is, can we turn this program around? Do we need to stop it? Or can we continue as, as it is, is going? And obviously, we, we came to the decision with all of the factors around uh, budgets and outcomes and, and consumer outcomes and community reputation that we needed to close it. So I think what, um, what I did to make that process as successful as possible was I gave myself a, and the team a really drawn out deadline and I worked from um, the deadline backwards. So it's about um, not rushing things. In 2020, we can't rip the Band-Aid off. No knee-jerk reactions. They don't work. Um, you know, change management's changed so much that and in a good good way, I believe that you know the ruling with an iron fist mantra is gone, um, and you know we need to really take on all factors as in the past people may not have done and just you know made the decision that they felt was right. But I think um, 
if you stick to deadlines and being transparent as possible along the journey, bringing your key people in um, and keeping people informed. So meeting with key stakeholders for me one-on-one -on -one in a lead up to the announcement was a chance for me to explain to them, look them in the eye and explain to these key stakeholders why I made a decision to close a program uh, before they read about it in the paper. So I think transparency and I think, um, you know, taking people on the journey with you and really believing in your message, because if you don't believe in your message, you're, you're not going to be able to convince others. They'll see right through it. So um, for me, you know, if, if that's kind of answered your question, Jess, it's, it's a lot of planning, transparency and um, making the right decision for the whole community. Um, and when you do make decisions such as program closure, you're not just dropping people off, you're, trans, you're trans, um, forming their lives, you're moving them in a different direction, but you've got to do that as well. You can't just say stop, you've got to actually support people to go to the next chapter. Thank you. And I'm going to stick with you for our final question. How do you manage some of the conflicts or some of the um, backlash that you might receive making those decisions? Yeah, well, they're pretty inevitable, aren't they? Like, I think um, um, throughout that journey, um, there was a bit, of, a bit of backlash and a bit of people, a few people that weren't entirely happy. And that's okay. Like I said at the start, um, these are community programs and people can scrutinise as much as they want. So, but I find um, what works for me and people may have different approaches. I'm not the guru of leadership or anything like that, but um, it's about grabbing the bull by the horns. And I, I would um, get on the phone. I'd invite people to a meeting, the one-on-one -on -one catch up with me. Let's have a coffee rather than um, reply to an email. I find with emails, once you reply to them, um, you, you lose control and you, and you can't, um, I guess, predict how people are going to interpret the text that you put in paper or whatever. So um, I find the the face to face conversation, looking people in the eye, and and really being genuine and saying these are the reasons I got to my decision. Um, of course, it impacts on me as well. You know, I'm a long standing member of the community, um, and you know it wasn't an easy decision. But I found throughout that process, um, when I stepped people through the reasons and the actual facts behind it, um, more often than not, they were okay. But I might say people, there were some people that would prefer just to email me and not catch up and that's okay as well. People handle things differently. Thank you. And back to Liana, if we can dial back to the decision-making process that you follow and any advice you can provide to people on the call around making a, a solid decision there. Um, so I think that uh, decision-making uh, is in, there are different decisions that you make. Uh, there are some that require, uh, you know, you've, you've got time to plan it out and you can take a path. There are some decisions that you need to make really swiftly. You know, anything to do with, with safety or um, uh, just things that come up on a day-to-day -day basis. You have to uh, back your judgment. So those uh, quick decisions that you have to make in day-to-day -day life, um, is usually based upon um, uh, experience, knowledge of the system, uh, you know, understanding your craft, so understanding what the opportunities might be. Really doing, I do a quick risk analysis every time and is, you know, and so one of the first things, and it, it might sound very morbid, but the question is, is anybody going to die? You know, I think it's a pretty... Uh, confronting question to ask yourself first off, because then that helps you elevate how quickly you need to move and what you need to do. So, um, you know, what is the decision that you need to make? My personal preference is always to be reflective and to take people with me on a journey or, and to learn from others. So I use a thing called triangulation. And so that is, I'm, I will get people who um, have shown to me that they are, you know, smart thinkers, trustworthy, uh, people that I'm happy to be really vulnerable with, and I'm happy to test things with them. So test the reasoning uh, and have them test me and then triangulating all of that information. And it usually ends up in a... Um, you know, it might be the same kind of position I was going to hold or it might change. I'm really clear that I don't have all the answers and I don't pretend to have all of the answers. There are people who have uh, more wisdom than I 
and I might have more wisdom than them in some things. So I try and uh, my preference is to talk to people, take people on a journey. I do have a no surprises policy. That's really important to me. So I try not to surprise anyone and I and my team uh, have already, they know that that's important to me not to be surprised. And I work the same with my counsellors. Um, but really, I think understanding that we don't all have every answer and it's okay to seek advice and assistance from others. Thanks, Liana. And, and how about managing conflicts or all those difficult periods? Yeah, well, they always come in uh, whenever you're in the public sector. And um, look, I have... I take complete responsibility for my organisation. So I will always be the one that takes the, um, the, the difficulty or takes the, the brunt of community unhappiness, uh, particularly if it's over something that the organisation has done. Uh, dealing with backlash, um, I'm a bit like Josh. I like to... Uh, if people are being difficult or nasty or uh, or just, you know, unkind, uh, that often happens. My preference is a bit like Josh's. I always make contact with them and, you know, just to look people in the eyes, have a conversation and work through what the issue might be from their perspective. So being open-minded, listening to what they've got to say. And then I'm hoping that they're gonna give me the same courtesy and listen open-minded to why I might've made the choice or what the situation actually is. But it is inviting people first to have a conversation. There are some times where uh, basically we'll I'll be on the front page of something. Everybody knows what that heat feels like. And it's distinctly unpleasant. But it is part of my job. And it is part of putting yourself up there and out there. And that's it. Thanks, Liana. I'm going to hand back to Christine to close the loop on any comments there. Uh, I think the two of you, Liana and Josh, have just given me... Um, uh, quite an extraordinary deeper insight of the sort of community leadership that I think in your region means my my second scenario, which is the one about um, uh, a positive and resilient future, is possible. So let me just go back to a couple of things that you said, and this is this is really my my summary. But I've got a deeper question that sits alongside of that. Uh, I think when you talk about, and both of you have done this in various different ways, about um, passion, it strikes me that in listening to you that two of the biggest gifts that community leaders can offer their communities are passion and time. And time is one of the most incredible gifts to give people because we have so little of it and we want to hang on to it and we want to meet it out and we just want to control it and... I mean, in the sorts of conversations that you've just had around uh, dealing with decisions that might come back at you, it strikes me that in any change that you try to bring around about, you're probably going to have to work with people who you uh, don't know, don't understand, may not agree with, and maybe don't even like. And yet, both Liana and Josh are suggesting that you offer them the best of yourself and that you offer them passion and time, which is a really hard thing to do, I, I think, because it's easier to, to turn away from uh, people who don't agree with us. So there's something there really quite special. Uh, you're also both talking about making lives better and having a sense of improvement, which is kind of my, my third question of what would better look like, and which sounds naive compared to the way you two have just <laughs> put to, put together your versions of it but there is something about not just doing stuff but doing stuff because it matters and it changes the way people live and it improves their circumstances so I think that that's really quite extraordinary 
Um, I love the idea of getting thanks from inside the supermarket. I love that, Josh, because um, I guess when I've worked across different sectors and I've worked with uh, CEOs and government ministers and I've been a ministerial advisor and I've worked, I've been a pro vice chancellor of a university, blah, blah. Uh, lots of people's motives for doing something is often to do with having a title or having power or a sense of importance or because they're paid well, or I'm not being cynical about that. I'm saying that if you think about you and all of you now saying yes to the jobs and the roles that you've got, um, that, that might've been a consideration that does it, that is, is it important purposeful work? And I'm also going to make good living out of it. So I'm not knocking any of that. I, I think what I, what I like about this inside a conversation around community leadership is uh, somebody who says thanks to you from inside the supermarket. In other words, it's the accidental, incidental bumping into somebody who didn't rehearse thank you, but just let you know that you made a difference. And it strikes me that if you make a difference to kind of one person of that sort, that you can kind of hang up your spurs because you've actually done something that's very, very profound. And it's one reason why I do a lot of work with local government. It is the most uh, raw level of government that is right in people's faces. It makes the most, um, the most profound difference in the way people live. And in the not-for-profit sector, uh, people are usually motivated because something better is possible and they go shopping for it. They spend their working life looking for it and trying to make that happen. So I love that. And I love too the sense that, well, the sentiment that, um, it strikes me that what you're talking about is, um, and I describe this when I'm doing some leadership workers, and I'm, so if I'm working in the not-for-profit sector, uh, if I'm trying to be unkind, which I don't often do, but I'm invited sometimes to be um, <clears throat> provocative, can I say that? Um, I, I talk about the difference between ambition and pity. You see, it's very easy to look at people who have had a tough, difficult period of time and feel sorry for them. I think the sort of community leadership that you're describing suggests that what is a much more forceful driver for change is ambition. It's hard to use the word better or improvement without thinking that you can make a positive difference in people's lives, which is very different to feeling sorry for people. And it's like you could say that the whole COVID story has, well, maybe it's just the people that I work with, but I can think of lots of people who now have gone through the same situation and who feel like they're victims. But there's the possibility of going through the same situation and not feeling like a victim. And I think the sort of community leadership that you're describing has the opportunity to seek out ambition over pity and work with people into, um, into the better tomorrows that I was that I was talking about. I think there's a really big difference between the mindset of ambition or or, or pity. If I just leave you thinking about that, um, I think Josh, you said something about. Um, well, you both have suggested this. People gravitating towards them, uh, and I would have you thinking about what it is that because this is, this is very interesting to me, what, what it is that has you gravitate towards someone in a leadership position, particularly when they're going to ask you to do something that's uncomfortable, that's possibly disturbing, that might take you away from your previous comforts. You see, history has very, very strong momentum. Let's talk about, oh, well, when we get back to normal. You see, normal feels like a comfortable place. I want to go back there. I can remember it. When you're talking about ambition over pity, you're actually talking about trying to imagine a life that we haven't yet had. And that requires possibility. That requires working closely with people around this sense of, so what would, what would better look like? And what would it actually take? And Liana, you're talking about um, humility and uh, listening really deeply and carefully and thoughtfully to people is is so important in this conversation. But if you're now thinking about the people who you follow willingly, and what is it about them that has you do that? And I don't mean in a hierarchy where you think, oh, well, I have to, I have to perform in a particular way because I will be judged. 
somebody's going to do a performance management routine on me and I will be judged. I'm talking about the sort of, and I think Josh and Liana are too, about community leadership where people follow you willingly. Not because, and I'll give you a really important number, it's 1652. And if you put a dollar sign in front of it, that's the fine you could have got during the lockdown. Now, there are lots of people who behaved the way they did because they were scared of being fined. You see, it's a big enough amount of money to get you to do certain things, but I'm not talking about manipulation or coercion or the fear of a fine. I'm talking about people who you will follow willingly because they're worth it and because they come across as, and I think you've talked about this, both of you, in, in a really smart way. They, uh, just looking at the words that you've used, uh, they connect with you as human beings, not as somebody who knows more and will insist on you behaving in a particular way, but people who you can influence because you're worth it. You're actually worth following and not because people are going to be scared of you or feel that they're going to be punished because they don't do something that you ask for. It's for people, when I've been a, a CEO of a statutory authority, I would like to think, though this is um, talk about romantic conceit, that, um, that a, lot of, a lot of what people did inside the organisation was because they, they thought it, it was the right thing to do and it mattered. I, in all honesty, I suspect that that they followed because I showed up the worst of myself. In other words, gee, I shouldn't be doing this on Zoom, should I? Gee, where have I gone? Um, that I, there were, so I'll confess, there were days when I thought, <clears throat> we are going to do this. And you are going to do this because I'm the CEO. <laughs> and I've said that it, it is what we are going to do. Uh, I should say very hastily <clears throat> to save my reputation, that was quite some time ago and I have grown up to be much more mature uh, and wiser since then. But there, but there is something about the quality of people that has you following them willingly when you don't feel like it, when it's five minutes to midnight and you just want to give up because you're tired or you're lazy or you're over it or you'd rather someone else did the work because it's easier to outsource it to someone. And like, what, the, what difference will it make? Like, okay, I'll come back to this tomorrow. And there's just something about some people when they say, look, it's five minutes to midnight, just stay. Let's just do this hard bit, just a bit longer. And people do it willingly. So I don't know the answer to this question, but I have a, I have a view about it. Um, that kind of community leadership, are people born with those skills? Is it just the way they are? Or can you actually do something about cultivating the sorts of characteristics that Liana and Josh have talked about? You see, I have to believe that it's possible that you can actually grow people's leadership. You can't, um, you can't insist on passion. You can't force people to make changes they don't want to make, oh, unless the figure of 1652 comes in and therefore they're punished for not behaving in a particular way. But there is something about being able to grow leadership in a community of the sort that we've just described, which is much more, I think, um, I think it's those people who you gravitate towards because they are worth it and they are authentic and they are from within the community and when they speak, they, and there's a whole other session that one could run on this, they actually use language to talk up to people and not talk to them. And if I just think about the last couple of months, who, um, and those leaders that I've listened to about my own health and well-being and safety, um, it hasn't worked that well for me to have somebody talking to me as if I'm a really badly behaved teenager. I think I've wanted authentic, raw facts delivered by somebody who uh, has a sense of positivity and is able to deliver those facts authentically 
and honestly and quickly and simply. And frankly, if I hear the word pivot one more time, and we're all in this together, it's okay, it's on, it's on Zoom, you see, I think I can say these things. And <clears throat> if I'm offending anybody, I, I'm protected by the screen. But my, my point is that there's something about the way in which the community leaders that I listen to and gravitate towards almost naturally, there's something about the way people use language to talk up to people and not down to people. It's not because they're using simple language, it's just that they have a sense of touch or what it is that people listening to them want to hear. And if leadership's about anything, it is about getting people to do something. It is about action. It's not about people being docile and benign and being ordered to do certain things or punished because they might not. It's because of being able to follow willingly. So is it possible to think about growing community leadership? Um, well, the answer for me has got to be absolutely yes. And I often start with uh, younger people, young people. I, and I do think if I just go back to one thing that I've said, it is possible to seek through the accumulation of small steps of service, what leadership can look like. And if you're working with any young people around this, um, it doesn't take much to, to make that happen. But it's possible, and you probably all do it anyway. I'm probably looking at a screen full of people and names who, uh, who go about community leadership without even realising that other people see you as community leaders. And sometime during today, you will have contact with someone that will offer you the opportunity to make a difference to their lives. And you'll do it because it's worth doing and you are probably naturals at doing this. But Liana, the other, the other comment that you made, I think is really interesting about making tough decisions and Josh did this too. I've stopped asking, particularly working with local government a lot, um, to try to find the answer between right and wrong, a right decision or a wrong decision. I've stopped asking that, at least I have. And that's much more about what's the best decision that you can make at the moment with the information that you've got. In other words, what's the best decision that you can make putting the community first? If you wait to try to find enough data information, input to work out the difference between right and wrong, uh, that might take a very, very long time. And will you ever get to the point where you will make everybody happy? That's not available. <laughs> so so um, I'm, I'm really grateful just because you invited Liana and Josh into the conversation. And, and I hope that there'll continue to be uh, questions and thoughts. I hope what, what we've done, the three of us, is to stimulate some of your thinking and um, if we've created any discomfort, I hope it is of the best kind. In other words, it's the kind of discomfort that has going, oh, and what did they say again about, yeah, okay, I need to think more about that. Is there something that I can do today that can actually strengthen my own leadership or offer deeper, more enduring support to other people who I think are community leaders and when it gets to five minutes to midnight and they are tired and worn out and ready to give up, that I'm the person who says, just a bit longer, can we just stay here with it? Just push a bit harder for just a extra couple of minutes. So Jessica, I'm really grateful for having the opportunity to spend time in the company of, uh, of all you lovely people. And, and I know that we'll have some sessions again over the, over the coming weeks, but I hope what we've done is begin conversation with you about what is community leadership and have you continue to ask and answer that question. Thanks, Chris. That's a wonderful way to, to wrap up today. And um, I'm aware of the time, but I would like to open the floor to questions while we have Chris, Josh and Liana on the line. There's certainly plenty to think about as we walk away today, but we do have a question. Um, and if you'd like to add it into the chat box, I can read it out um, on behalf of you. So the first one, Chris, regarding time versus decision, how do you give people confidence that progress is being made, but for the progress to be made, you are better to delay the final decision as long as the possible, sorry, as long as possible with the maximum information provided? That's from Chris Sanis. Um, I think, so just a, one, one quick way to consider doing this is uh, making a judgment about how patient people can be and how much uncertainty they can carry. Sometimes, sometimes, and this is a question of judgment, 
sometimes it's better to start making some small steps that people can actually see and experience, particularly at a time when their emotions are really heightened and they're much more, we all are actually, we're much more motivated by what we think we're going to lose rather than what we're going to gain. And if you can start, I guess, nourishing people's uh, positive expectations and start showing some bite-sized results, you really then can start building on those time and time again. Sometimes it's a question of, um, in fact, no community that I'm working with or have done over the last couple of years has been able to go from sort of um, A through to X, Y, Z straight away. It's often been small steps and it's often been by accretion. In other words, there's been a group of people who have gone about this work as a team or as a group and they have taken small steps and built confidence that way. And every time, and it hasn't been a straight line, it hasn't been a kind of neat curve from beginning to end. But, um, but one thing I have learned is that it's, it's impossible in a community to build a future without involving people who are then affected by the decisions that you make. So it's quite often a, a time to keep going back and keep having the conversations. And if you use that particular framework that I've given you, in other words, what's worked, what hasn't, and what comes next, and how we're going to do that, uh, it might seem really cartoonish and a bit simple, but they're open questions. And you can usually in that conversation, and I've probably run these conversations with probably all up maybe six or 7,000 Victorians. I'm not saying that that's a grand thing, but there's something in offering open-ended questions that actually encourage people to not become dependent on you, but to actually take up some of that responsibility and share some of that design work. Thanks, Chris. Next question from Sarah. How do you take people experiencing extreme personal grief or loss on a journey of community ambition? Who's, who's that question to, Jessica? That's to you, Chris. Um, so I'm not going to be facetious when I say slowly. Um, I think particularly, particularly during these last, well, couple of months, um, it's very hard to offer people certainty when there isn't any. It's very hard to offer people a promise that things will be okay when it might not be. Uh, it's very unfair sort of build this rosy future when you don't know that that's actually going to be possible. So I guess what I've, if I just use the Bushfires Royal Commission consultation, so we were out there uh, across 23 municipal shires six weeks after the, yeah, after the fires. Um, there were people in those sessions who couldn't speak to us because they were so broken and damaged by what had just happened, who had lost family members who um, were not in any kind of shape to have that conversation with me. But you see, they were there. So they came out of their houses, or they came out of wherever they were staying, and they, they listened. And so what I tried to do in those sessions, and I'm not saying I'm an expert at this, was to uh, surround them with people who were in a conversation so that they would slowly be drawn out and feel that their confidence could grow. I mean, this, this is also true in the Mental Health Royal Commission that I'm working with at the moment. Um, there are lots and lots of, maybe it's just the work that I do, but there are people who will uh, come into this conversation and want to tell or listen to the stories of the worst things that have happened to people's in, in people's lives. What I've discovered is that there is safety in telling stories and listening to stories, as opposed to kind of reading out policy proclamations or talking points or um, media releases. There's something incredibly powerful about the connection that you can make with other people by listening to their stories and sharing your own. And sometimes uh, the role of the facilitator, and lots of people can do this work, is to be the person who asks the questions and to make the judgment about whether or not people have got the sort of emotional health to make that contribution. And they might not have on that day and they might not have for weeks after, which is why I was being slightly facetious when I say slowly, because it might not be possible today, but it might be possible two weeks, two months, 
uh, years down the track. Um, I, know, I know how blisteringly hard some incidents in local communities are and how a long history follows them through. I can still talk to people in, in Kerrang who will bring up the rail disaster. It's a long time ago, but it's still there. It's still alive and people can take you back to the emotions and how they feel. So uh, I guess they're just a, a, a couple of lessons, but it is making a judgment about whether or not people can withstand the conversation. It's about bringing them in to listen to other people's stories. And it's something to do with encouraging other people to then tell their stories by using some open-ended questions. Uh, that's, that's what I'd suggest because my experience, I guess, has taught me that that's a, a, a gentle and respectful way of bringing people into a conversation that they would find hard otherwise. Thank you, Chris. That's great. And I think we will leave it there. Um, it's now 1.35, so we best let people get back to work. Um, but if you do have further questions for Chris, Josh or Liana, please get in touch with myself and I can certainly pass them on and get them answered um, for you. So again, my sincere thanks um, on behalf of Wimmera Development Association and Leadership Wimmera to Chris, Josh and Liana for being our guest today. Um, absolutely wonderful to have you along. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity um, to remind people on the call about the second forum that we'll have with Chris again next week, next Tuesday on June 23, starting at 12.30. And we're going to be addressing collaboration in leadership. Our local um, guest for that session is Amelia Crafter, who's at Wimmera Healthcare Group. And she's going to talk about the process of the Wimmera Cancer Centre build um, in Horsham. That uh, forum is all about working effectively and efficiently with stakeholders to support your community or project to achieve a positive outcome. So we really look forward to that session next week. Um, you can visit the WDA website or contact me directly um, to register for those. Again, thank you very much for your attendance. I wish you a wonderful day and um, happy leading. Thanks everybody, see you again. Thank you.